with you today. Well, before our service begins, as folks are getting settled, I have one quick announcement. Registration for Journey to Judea will be open to the public on November 1st. However, tomorrow we are providing the opportunity for Countryside to access pre-registration. This will run through October 31st. Now, the purpose of pre-registration is evangelistic. It allows you to register those you would like to reach with the gospel through J2J. So we ask that you not use this to reserve tickets in your name to hand out to people or to register friends wanting you to do them a good favor because you have early access. The Journey to Judea business cards are in the foyer. They're there so that you can use them to invite your unsaved neighbors, your friends, family, and coworkers. So please take as many as you can possibly use. Now you're going to receive an email tomorrow with instructions including the links for pre-registration. If you're not on our email list, just contact the church office and you'll get added. Well, it's always encouraging when someone joins our church body. Here's a brief introduction to our newest member. Hi, my name is Rebecca Friesen. Uh, I've been attending Countryside since February of this year. Um, I wanted to become a member here because I've really been encouraged by the fellow believers here who have come alongside me and helped just encourage me in my walk with the Lord. And um, I want to be held accountable by a church that holds scripture as highly as this one does. At this time, I'd like to ask you all to stand. Let's open our service with these words from Psalm 24, verses 7 and 8. It says this, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Let's worship God together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. Dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and You're slow to anger. Your name is great and Your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like that before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my 
my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Lord, I'll worship Your. our need, for we are broken and weak. Who is the gift of God to be, the source of life, hope, and peace? Jesus, the great I am. Jesus, the great I am. the light that shows the way to give us freedom from sin who lived on earth in perfect days as the truth the one way in Jesus the great I am Jesus the great I am the light, he is the light, heaven's bread and mighty light, he is the shepherd and the vine, I am his and he is mine, he is the door, the way secure, Jesus is the great. shepherd of my heart, the voice that I recognize, who is the door out of the dark, heaven's breath that satisfies, Jesus the great I am, Jesus the great I am, he is the
shepherd and the vine. I am yours and you are mine. You are the door, the way secure. Jesus, you're the great I am. Jesus, you're the great I am. Good morning. Great to see you this morning. Um, as we prepare to go to prayer and have communion, if you've not yet picked up one of these uh, communion packets, please feel free to do that now. Um, we are going to uh, celebrate communion for believers, so if you're a Christian, do that. Um, as we go to the Lord in prayer, um, we want to recognize God's faithfulness, we want to recognize His provision, recognize who He is. So let's turn our attention toward Him together. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you that we get to worship such a great God, a God who is uh, sufficient for um, life and godliness, who gives us all things to enjoy, who provides for our needs. We thank you for that provision and recognize that we give back to you only because we have received so much from you. So bless our offerings and these gifts. May you use them for your glory. We also want to pray for um, Roger and Crystal in Brazil specifically that you would help Roger as he um, deals with what to do next regarding um, his neurological condition. Just give him peace, grant him uh, favor and grace. We pray for Crystal that you would help her just to deal with this news and, and give them both a way forward. Bless their services today as they um, have an opportunity to worship with your people and to teach the word. Uh, grow your church in Brazil. And then for uh, Brian and Danielle in, in Mexico continue to um, help them today as uh, Danielle is um, up here for a few days to spend with friends and family and uh, in our church. We pray that you would bless Brian as he's down in Mexico discipling and training nationals and teaching today. Um, just bless your word and use it to accomplish much in uh, Mexico for your glory. Also for Lawrence and Redemption Hill pray for those guests that do not know you that are visiting them, that they would come to saving faith in Jesus. Also that the believers would be encouraged and built up through the teaching of your word in the Gospel of Luke. Help J.D. as he shepherds and counsels and Stephen as he um, serves uh, the people there. Just that you would glorify your name in that church. Then for countryside, we have a lot of things happening with Journey to Judea coming up and people serving and ministering. Just bless our efforts, may you be glorified in what we do for your name. We count it a privilege to be involved in your mission. We count it a privilege to worship you, to know you, to be in relationship with you. Thank you for that, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> if you are a follower of Christ, this is really a, a time for you to join in and celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior yet, um, we hope that you experience um, hearing the gospel here. Uh, but communion is really a family deal. It's for those who know Jesus. And so we'd ask that you refrain. If you're under church discipline, uh, we'd also ask that you hold back from celebrating communion. Um, this is really a powerful time. Watch, listen to what God has to say through the time of communion. And like we do every time we celebrate communion, it's a time for us to examine our hearts, uh, to bring to light those things maybe that are hidden, um, I don't know about you, but every week there's things I find in this time of self-examination, of God examining our hearts, that things are brought to the surface. Uh, motives, um, attitudes, actions, words that don't honor God. This is a time where we can really uncover what's been hidden, confess it to God, and experience His grace. So let's pray together as the instruments play.
It's so refreshing, Lord, to be able to come to you with the cares and burdens and even the sins um, that are on our heart. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, your kindness to us, for your forgiveness. Thank you for cleansing us. And we're so grateful that we, that we don't have to cower from you because of what happened on the cross. That we are now made righteous through Jesus' sacrifice. Our sins have been paid for in full. That debt is paid. Thank you. And for this time of communion, we pray that as we focus on the cross, that you would lift our, our hearts as we recognize what Jesus accomplished there for us and what he endured for us. Bless this time in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, the cross. Um, every week I stand really kind of in the shadow of that big, big cross. Uh, 20, well, 18, 20 years ago when we built this building, it was really important to have the cross front and center. But the cross, to many, um, has lost its significance. It's a symbol. Um, and for some people, no more than that. For some, it's just a good luck charm. It's a, a decoration. It is a, a piece of jewelry. Maybe it's a cool tattoo. But for us, for Christians, the cross has eternal significance because of what Jesus accomplished there. So I want to consider what happened on the cross when Jesus was crucified is sort of our communion meditation. On Thursday night, uh, following the Last Supper, Jesus uh, led his disciples uh, across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives to a secluded place, a garden where they could have a time of prayer. It was an hour later that Judas arrived with several hundred soldiers and Jesus was arrested. Early then, on Friday morning, Jesus was stripped of his clothing and he was tied to a, a post where he was then scourged. His skin was literally shredded from his back. Around 9 a.m., Jesus was made to carry a large wooden beam through the streets of Jerusalem to the place called Golgotha, meaning a skull. This is where he was crucified. His body was broken his blood was shed. So what did Jesus endure on the cross? Well, consider first the tremendous physical suffering Jesus endured on the cross. When they got to the place of execution, the soldiers that were in charge of Jesus' crucifixion offered him wine mixed with myrrh to drink. Uh, this was a, a mild sedative. It wasn't to ease Jesus' pain. It was to make their job of nailing him to the cross easier. But according to Mark 15, 23, Jesus didn't take that. He wanted to have a clear head as he experienced the full fury of the agony that he would endure on the cross. You see, Jesus would be drinking the cup of the Father's wrath, and he wanted to be alert as he drank every drop. Soldiers then held Jesus' arms as nails were driven through his hands just above the wrists, and attached him to the wooden beam. The soldiers then hoisted up the beam and dropped its center notch over the post that had been set into the ground. A single spike was then driven through both of Jesus' feet, through his Achilles tendons, securing him to the post. According to Psalm 2214, the weight of Jesus' body caused all of his major joints to slip out of place. His limp body actually then constricted his diaphragm. You see, Jesus could breathe in with no problem, but he had to push himself up with his legs on the, all the weight being on the, the nail through his feet in order to be able to breathe out, just to exhale. So with each breath, Jesus lacerated back, scraped up and down against the wooden beam. This significant blood loss, all of the dehydration and the physical trauma took an agonizing toll on Jesus' body. It was excruciating. Yet there was something that Jesus endured that was even more dreadful than what he suffered physically. Consider, second, the tremendous spiritual suffering Jesus endured on the cross. 
Mark 11, verse 33 says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sixth hour is 12 noon. The ninth hour would be three. So as the darkness, which came at midday, came, that darkness served to veil those who mocked Jesus from the intense spiritual agony that he endured. You see, the transaction that occurred during those dark hours was too holy for human eyes to behold. Because at that moment, our sin was placed on Jesus as the Lamb of God. And he endured the Father's wrath as that sin was being judged. So because Jesus bore our sin, during those hours of darkness, God the Father had to turn his face away from God the Son. Mark 15, 34 says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was not a question of not knowing. It was rhetorical. Jesus knew he was being forsaken because of our sin. He was being punished as if he had committed every wicked deed done by every sinner who would ever believe. So the physical pains of crucifixion, as dreadful as they were, were nothing compared to the agony of enduring the Father's wrath. Now at this point in the crucifixion, John 19.30 says that sour wine was extended to Jesus. It says when he had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus took the sour wine so that his last words could be heard by those who were there. The statement, it is finished, was not a cry of defeat. This was a proclamation of victory. The word for it is finished, to telestai, means to carry out a task to its full completion. In other words, in saying that, Jesus was declaring that everything required in God's law has been completed. That every prophecy predicted in Scripture about the Son of God taking on sin is now fulfilled. That everything needed to be done to save sinners is now done. What this meant was that God's justice had been satisfied. It was finished. Sin's debt had been paid. It was finished. The enemy had been defeated. It was finished. Redemption had been accomplished. It was finished. God's will had been fulfilled. It was finished. After this cry of victory, Jesus bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. You see, with nothing left to accomplish, Jesus simply bowed his head and yielded up his spirit and died. No one took Jesus' life. Jesus laid his life down willingly by himself. So what do we see in the crucifixion? We see the love of God who gave his son so we could be reconciled to God and have a relationship with him. We see the power of God which broke the chains of sin so we could become free from sin. We see the holiness of God which condemns sin in the flesh so that we could be holy. We see the mercy of God as Jesus took our place as he paid our debt so that we could be saved. So the bread that we eat, the juice that we drink, every week in communion, reminds us that Jesus' body was given and it was broken. So consider the cross where his body was broken, where his blood was shed for you. Go ahead and take off the cellophane wrapper off the bread. And as you do that, I'll ask Ron Craven to pray before we eat. Uh, please pray with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you are holy. You are sovereign. You are high and uh, risen up. You are um, so far beyond us, transcendent. And yet you sent your son, your only son, to come and, and 
take our place and die on the cross, a rugged, brutal cross, a brutal death uh, for the sins that we've committed. We are just so grateful and uh, eternally humbled and thankful for the uh, grace and mercy that you've shown to us through Jesus. And Lord, we just, as we remember this bread and, and uh, Jesus' broken body, we just thank you for what that means to us and that we can remember that today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and told them to eat in remembrance of him. Let's eat together. Go ahead and open the uh, cellophane covering the juice as Bo Lynch leads us in prayer. Let's pray. God, as we observe the cross today and relive the bloody scene that led to your death, we cringe as we think through the events, but it's amazing as we get to stand here today and be a part of your family. Lord, we know that's only possible because of that sacrifice. Lord, I pray too that we would understand and see that that was a complete gift. It wasn't a fight till the end. Lord, you gave yourself as a gift to us. Lord, please help us uh, take that. And as we remember with this cup today, Lord, I pray that we would die daily and sacrifice ourselves in Jesus' name. As we remember him, let's drink this cup. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue worshiping together. Trust my Savior Jesus when my darkest doubts befall. Trust Him when to simply trust Him seems the hardest thing of all. I can trust my Savior Jesus. Trust Him when my strength is small, for I know the shield of Jesus is the safest place of all. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust You more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever young. I will trust my Savior Jesus. He has said his way is best, for I know. died for me 
What can I bring for your gift is complete? So I trust you, simply trust you, Lord, with every part of me. Father, we love you, and we count it a privilege to be able to worship you, to learn from you. We want to be more like your son. We know that's your will for our lives, so please accomplish that work today for your glory. Amen. You may be seated. Well, several weeks ago, I had the opportunity to teach Pastor Brian's Sunday morning Bible class and to teach on the subject of prayer after that class, several people suggested, either through email or through um, just talking with me personally, that the material from that particular class actually ought to be taught to the entire church. And when it comes to my own life spiritually, yeah, I mean, I, I need to hear about prayer. I need to learn. I need to be reminded. It's the basics, right? That's where we tend to sort of struggle. And so that's what I'm going to be doing this morning. Now, I assume that if you're a Christian, you already understand that prayer is to be an important part of your relationship with God, right? I mean, you get that. I don't have to make that case. But I probably guess that making prayer a consistent aspect of your relationship with God is something that you likely struggle with from time to time. If you're like me, I remember when um, I was a young believer, I really struggled with prayer, how to pray. There were times in my life, even as a pastor, that I struggled with prayer. You know, the two things a pastor is really supposed to do, I mean, the two non-negotiables, prayer and ministry of the Word. It's not easy. Do you remember when Jesus found his disciples sleeping in the garden the night that he was betrayed? He said to Peter, he says, could you not watch with me for one hour? And we read that and we go, yeah, Peter, man, what's your problem? What's your deal? Couldn't you watch with Jesus for an hour? And yet, let me ask you, when's the last time you prayed for an hour? Ooh, not so easy. Try it sometime. Well, it's one thing to read about prayer, to study the topic of prayer, to talk about prayer. It's another thing entirely to pray. I hadn't been saved very long, and I was with a group of new, other new believers, and we were sharing what God was doing in our lives. And at the end of that discussion, the leader said that we would then go around the circle and everyone would pray. I panicked. I mean, are you kidding me? I'd never prayed with anyone. I, I had prayed by myself a lot, but I never prayed out loud with anyone. And I was scared to death. See, I wasn't sure if, if the way that I talked to God was right. My vocabulary didn't sound like everybody else's vocabulary. 
The way that I expressed my heart to God was different than what I heard. And so as each person prayed, I started going through my mind. You know, what I would say. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll start. Most beloved Heavenly Father. Yeah, that's good. No, that's not how I talk to God. And maybe, maybe, maybe I'll just throw in a few of these phrases that I hear. And I, it, it, nothing sounded right in my head. So finally, when the person next to me started praying, I just gave up. And I determined that what I was going to do is just to talk to God and not care what anybody else around me thought. Just to focus on Him. And you know what? I survived. After we were done, somebody came up to me and said, you know, Mike, I, I just really love the way that you prayed because you just talked to God from your heart. And really, folks, that's all that prayer is. It's not a speech that we give so that others are impressed. It's not a list of demands that we're making from God. It's not a moment of silence. It's not sort of being alone in your own thoughts. No, prayer is simply the way that a believer communicates to God from the heart. Think about it. When we pray, we are actually entering into the very throne room of God and asking Him for whatever we need. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. Hebrews 4.16, he says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, we're able to approach God with confidence because of what Jesus, our sympathetic high priest, accomplished on our behalf. See, through his work on the cross, we've been granted direct access to God. So whenever we pray, we're actually coming into the very throne room of the king of kings. And we get an audience with him. Have you ever walked into a room? It was obvious that you didn't belong there. I remember uh, my mom telling me a story that they were down at Kansas City uh, at some big hotel and they saw that there was a banquet room where a bunch of people were going through a food line and so they got in the food line and got their plate and they started going through and and uh, they looked around and noticed that oh this is odd and so they asked the person that they were with like what's who's this group and they said oh this is the meeting of the um, NC uh, was it NAACP oh we're not supposed to be here and so they left well, if you've ever walked into a room and it was obvious that you didn't belong, if you're a believer, this is one room where you do belong. Here it's called the throne of grace. This means that for the Christian, it's no longer a throne of judgment. So as we draw near to the throne of grace through prayer, we don't have to fear being kicked out. We belong there. This is where we receive whatever we need. You see, through prayer we receive all the grace that we need and all the mercy that we need to help us in our time of need. So God wants us to come before Him in prayer. He desires that we express to Him all that's in our hearts through prayer. You see, by calling on God in prayer, we're expressing to Him that we trust Him, we depend on Him, we see Him as the giver of all that we need. But here's the deal. I mean, doesn't God already know everything that we need? Doesn't God know what we think, what we desire? Doesn't he know what we need? Doesn't he know what we struggle with? Doesn't he already know all of our frustrations and all of our cares and all of our hurts? Absolutely. In fact, there is nothing about us that God doesn't already know. In Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4, King David acknowledged, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. So we don't pray to inform God about anything. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 8, your father knows what you need 
before you ask him. What I want to do this morning is just simply make several observations about prayer that we find in Scripture. This is kind of a breathe a little bit from our study through Daniel. We're going to look at something that's very practical. It's not going to be exhaustive. It's not going to say everything there is to say about prayer. That would be a series that would take us months. But these are a few observations that I find incredibly practical and formative for us, for me. The first is this. The first concerns why pray. Why pray? I mean, if God already knows everything about us, even what we need before we ask, then why bother praying? Let me just suggest three reasons. First, we pray because God is pleased when we pray. And that's what we want to do. Like Paul said, it's our aim to please the Lord, and we want to please Him, so we pray. And Proverbs 15, 8 says that the delight, God delights in the prayer of the upright. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Notice this. But the prayer of the upright is acceptable to Him. The contrast in this proverb is between what God hates and what God loves. The word acceptable indicates that the prayer of the upright meets with God's favor. It delights him. It pleases him. So when you talk to God and when you acknowledge him as the source of all you need, God is pleased. God is pleased. Second, we pray because God instructs or asks us to pray. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2, 1, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Those are all four different terms referring to communication with God. It's that those things be made for all people. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul wrote, Pray without <clears throat> ceasing. Now listen, God asks us to pray because <clears throat> he understands that we need to pray. He doesn't need us to pray. We need to pray. And God understands that. We need to guide our hearts to him and then express to him, articulate to him the needs that are on our hearts. So we pray because God instructs us to pray because that's what we need. Third, we pray because God works through prayer. God works through prayer. Now, the Bible teaches that God is sovereign, that he does whatever he pleases, right? However, he has determined to make certain things dependent on prayer, things that he would not do apart from prayer. That's why James 4.2 says that you do not have because what? You do not ask. I think what John MacArthur has written about this is extremely helpful to me. He says, quote, The Bible is unequivocal about God's absolute sovereignty. Yet within his sovereignty, he commands us to exercise our responsible wills in certain areas, including beseeching him in prayer. If God did not act in response to prayer, Jesus' teaching about prayer would be futile and meaningless and all commands to pray pointless. Our task is not to solve the dilemma of how God's sovereignty works with human responsibility, but to believe and act on what God commands us about prayer. So the purpose of prayer is not to inform God about our needs. It is to personally express, to articulate those needs within our heart to Him. A second observation I want to make this morning concerns how to pray. And to do that, I want you to turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This is perhaps verses 6 through 7 in Philippians 4. It's my favorite passage in the Bible on prayer. Here's what it says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this familiar passage tells us that rather than allow our hearts to be 
anxious, we are to guide our hearts to God in prayer. Now I want you to notice that there are three words in this verse that describe how we are to go before God. Let's look at them. Number one, the first is prayer. Prayer. Paul says, in everything, by prayer, let your requests be made known to God. The word prayer simply refers to the basic act of communicating with God. And Paul says here that we are to communicate, to talk to God about everything. That's the content. What this means is that whatever is on your heart, your sorrows, your fears, your frustrations, your concerns, your needs, all of those things you are to expose to God in prayer. That is, you are to articulate them. So Paul says, rather than be anxious about these things, you're to talk to God about them. And no issue, no concern in your heart is off the table. It's not like, well, I can't talk to God about that. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing. So God already knows it. You need to articulate it. You need to express it. He wants you to express everything to him in prayer. The second word I want you to notice is the word supplication. Paul says, in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. So while prayer refers to the general act of communicating with God, the word supplication refers to the specific petitions or requests that we bring before God in prayer. The point is that the requests that we bring to God in prayer are not to be vague. They're not to be general. We don't just bring up large, vague categories. When we pray something like, God, help me, that's general. It's vague. But when we pray, Lord, I'm really struggling with what to do at work. I feel stuck because I don't know that I have time to do what I'm asked to do. So please help me to know how to proceed. Help me to not become anxious about this. Help me to be productive with the time that I have. So that kind of prayer is detailed and specific. It's not just, God help, you know the issue. No, it's here's, as I, as I unpack it, this is what I feel like I need help with. That kind of prayer is detailed and specific. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. All your anxieties. In order to cast all your anxieties on God means that you are going to have to identify the specific anxieties that are on your heart as you pray. Nothing's too big, nothing's too small to take to the Lord. So we got prayer. We've got supplication. Third word, thanksgiving. Paul says, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, the word thanksgiving refers to the gratitude that we feel, that we express to God when we pray. So praying with gratitude expresses a confidence in God. It reflects that we know that God hears the specific requests we're bringing to him in prayer. Maybe you can understand it this way. When we go through something difficult, well, I'll just personalize it. When I go through something difficult, something that's painful, I can feel anxious about that. I mean, I can kind of, my stomach kind of gets in knots and it's like, oh, this is a big deal. And then that feeling of anxiety can actually be reflected in my prayer when I talk to God about it. And so, as I pray about my anxieties, I actually get more worked up, or I can get more worked up. It can be kind of like this. Oh, God, this thing is bad. This big. Uh, uh, you've got to do something. I don't know what I'm going to do. You've got to do something. Everything's falling apart, right? What am I going to do? That's not prayer that's rooted in faith. That prayer is rooted in unbelief. It's praying with anxiety rather than praying with thanksgiving. So Paul says that as we let our request be made known to God, our prayer and supplication is to be governed by thanksgiving. So praying with thanksgiving is different than what I just illustrated. It's more like this. 
It's more like, Lord, this thing is really hard for me right now. But I know that you're the Lord. You're the God of all flesh. There's nothing that's too hard for you. Thank you that what I'm going through at this moment is not taking you by surprise. God, thank you that what you are going to accomplish as I go through this is going to be for your glory and for my good. Thank you that your grace is sufficient, Lord. Thank you that your pur purpose is perfect. Please help me to see you in this thing. Please give me wisdom to respond to you correctly and to glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to draw close to you as you work. See, that's bringing your request before the Lord with thanksgiving. It's requests that's governed by a confidence in God, a thanksgiving. It's a prayer that's rooted in faith that looks to God with confidence. And notice the result of bringing these specific requests to God with thanksgiving. It, Paul says that you experience, notice, the peace of God. The peace of God. Paul says this is a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that can't be manufactured. It's a peace that can't be imitated. It can't be kind of ginned up and produced. No, this is the peace of God. It comes from the very source of peace, who is God himself. And notice what the peace of God does. Paul says that it guards your heart and mind. The word guard here is a, a military term that expresses protection. So as you pray with thanksgiving, the peace of God actually stands guard over the inner you, over your heart, over your mind as you bring your anxieties to him in prayer. So these verses teach that you're not to be anxious about anything, but instead you're to pray about everything because prayer is the means through which God provides for your needs. So you're to continually express your heart to him. But while we are to pray when we're confronted with things that makes us anxious, we should also have times that we set aside to God for prayer. A time that is devoted to God in prayer is probably one of the most promoted aspects of the Christian life, along with time for reading God's Word. But it's also, I think, one of the most inconsistently practiced. You've probably, like me, had seasons in your life where a daily time with God was consistent. But you've probably also had seasons, like me, where it was inconsistent or maybe even non-existent. Have you ever wondered why we struggle to maintain a vibrant and intimate and consistent daily time with God in prayer? Especially in light of how integral it is to spiritual maturity? Well, there may be several reasons, which leads to the third observation about prayer. And this concerns obstacles to prayer that get in the way. Now, maybe you don't have a consistent prayer time with God because of the obstacle of your appetite. What I mean is that maybe you just don't have a desire. It's kind of like a duty. Ah, oh, i got to do this thing. Yeah, I know, because he's going to be teaching on prayer again sometime, and I don't want to feel as bad as I do right now. i got to do that. There's just no desire there. You don't have a hunger to spend time with God because your mind's so full of other things that you feed on throughout the day. I mean, honestly, just kind of put aside the pretense for a minute. We are involved in all kinds of crazy stuff that occupies our minds. Where God isn't even, like, remotely connected to our thoughts. Some of you go through life, this is, this is, you know, you're getting a muscle right here because you're doing so much of that throughout the day. So you don't have an appetite to meet with God. Now listen, what would happen if I just, all day long, I just kind of gorged myself on potato chips and donuts? And then at 6 o'clock when I went in for dinner, Karen's made this really nice, like there's potatoes, 
and there's asparagus, and there's a filet mignon steak right there with salad. I'm going to look at that and go, ooh, I know that's good, but it doesn't look good right now. I'm full. I don't care to eat that. So it could be that you don't have a consistent prayer time with God because of the obstacle of your appetite. And what I'd say is, if that's the case, stop eating the donuts and the potato chips and enjoy the meal. Set your heart, train your heart to have an appetite to pray. Second, it could be because of the obstacle of your expectation. Maybe your expectation is, well, every time I meet with God, it's supposed to be a Mount Sinai, Moses, God experience. I mean, there's supposed to be lightning and thunder and smoke. And when I'm done, my face is to shine. You know, I've looked at my face after meeting with God and it's not shining. When I meet with God, it's quiet and still. But because perhaps you expect it to be more, it doesn't seem like time alone with God. It just seems like time alone. You know what I mean? If that's the case, hey, reset your expectations. I think you would be shocked to know that, I mean, my, what I do for a living, I have the privilege, and I love this privilege. I get to spend every day studying God's Word, right? And I have time, you pay me for that, to spend time in prayer. But every time that I do that, it's not like, you know, ooh, I just felt it. It's not that way. It's kind of like, all right, I did that, and I believe that that was effective. But I don't feel a certain way. I'm not, you know, like jumping up and down. There's no, um, I'm not rolling down any aisles. But I know I met with God because the Bible tells me that I did. There's a third obstacle, and that's the obstacle of your ignorance. I don't mean your stupidity. That's not what I mean here. It may be that you understand the importance of spending time alone with God every day, but you just aren't sure what to do. You really aren't sure how to pray. And I'm going to address that in a minute. Before I do, I think there are a couple of things that we need to guard against that need to be brought out. So here's some observations on what to guard against in prayer. These are important things because they kill effective prayer. First, guard against praying with motives that are selfish. Guard against praying with motives that are selfish. See, when you pray with ulterior motives, motives that attempt to use God, sort of like God is your, you know, he's your genie and you get him all worked up just right and he's going to come out of that bottle and he's going to grant you whatever you want. Maybe that's how you view God and prayer. Not at all. We don't use God to gratify our selfish desires. If we do, that prayer is ineffective. James 4.3 says, You ask and do not receive. Why? Well, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. See, instead of your prayers being all about you and your passions, they need to be about God and His passions. They need to be about His will. 1 John 5.14 says, This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything, notice this, according to his will. It doesn't say according to our desires. It's according to his will. He hears us. See, when we ask God for the things that he desires, as expressed in his word, we can be confident in prayer. However, when we ask for things that only serve to feed our flesh, to draw us away from God... We're not asking according to his will. God answers prayers that glorify him. John 14, 13, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So asking God to do something in Jesus' name isn't something that we staple on the end of our prayer. It's approaching God with requests that are consistent with who Jesus is as God. This phrase that Jesus used, in my name, refers to all that Jesus is as God. So praying in his name is appealing to the Father on behalf of his Son. And as you approach God this way, what it does is it prevents you from 
the kind of covetous prayers that puts you and your wants in the center. No, when you pray in Jesus' name, you're praying for what's consistent with his word, with his truth, with his will, with his character. So the main purpose of prayer is not for me to get stuff. No, it's for God to be glorified. But what about praying for the things that you're unsure about? I mean, isn't it true we don't always know how we ought to pray about a certain thing? There's going to be times when you don't know what you should ask for. Well, in these cases, God has you covered to make sure that the right things get prayed for. Listen to Romans 8, 26 and 27. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. These aren't our groanings. These aren't our words. These aren't sounds coming out of our mouth. This is the Spirit who's interceding for us, not through us. And notice it says, And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So guard against praying with motives that are selfish and self-centered. Second, guard against praying with a heart that harbors sin. I think another thing that gets in the way is a heart that's unwilling to confess and forsake sin. We're just holding on to something. In fact, you know it. Every time that we have communion, right? We have that time of self-examination. There's something there that you're not really willing to address. That's harboring sin. It's a heart that actually cherishes sin. And listen to what Psalm 66, 18 says about that. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Isaiah 50, verse 1. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So when you harbor sin, there's a bigger issue on the table. And God's not going to listen to your request because your sin needs to be cleansed. So, what do you do if that's the case? You submit to God. You confess your sin. You forsake it. And you respond to God out of a heart that wants to honor Him. Turn to um, Mark chapter 1 for a minute. I want to consider fifth. Jesus' example in prayer. Jesus' example in prayer. You know, it's fascinating to me that in three years of ministry, Jesus accomplished more for eternity than any person has ever accomplished in a lifetime. Because Jesus said in John 17, 4, that he accomplished the work the Father gave him to do. He fulfilled everything God gave him to do. And yet, with all of that, we never find Jesus in the Gospels being frantic. We never find him being anxious. We never find him rushing around with this sense of, you know, like, got to get this done, you know, making everybody crazy around him. Uh, each day he knew exactly what he was to do and exactly where he was to be. And he always did what the will of his father was, no more, no less. So I love this. In Mark 1, 32 through 38, after a day of serving and giving himself to others, it says, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And then notice this, next day. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. I love this, that Jesus started his day by intentionally meeting with the Father. And because of this, he was never stressed about the things that other people thought he should be doing. 
Compare this with how the disciples were frantically looking for him. And when they found him, what did they do? They insisted that he go back with them and do what they thought he should do. But this is not the Father's plan, and Jesus knew it. So he said in verse 38, hey, we're going to go on to the next towns so that I can preach there. That's why I came out. So he was going to the next towns to do what the Father wanted him to do there. He never allowed, this is a good principle for those of you who are business owners, he never allowed the needs around him to determine his schedule. For him, it was always about the will of the Father. That was the agenda that drove Jesus. And where did he get that agenda? It's found in verse 35. Look at what it says. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. By the way, this was not an isolated incident. This was Jesus' regular practice because Luke 5.16 says, quote, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. This is what he did all the time. I think many of us believe that meeting with God in prayer is a good thing. We just don't see it as indispensable. And because we don't see it as indispensable, we don't have a problem skipping meeting with God in prayer to get other more important things done. But for Jesus, this was the one thing in his schedule that was indispensable. I want you to notice some observations from this verse that I find very helpful for me. First, because prayer was a priority, Jesus sacrificed for it to happen. He sacrificed for it to happen. It says, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. So Jesus knows he's facing another full day and it's going to be maxed out. So what did he do? He said, I'm going to have to make some time to pray. He made time in his schedule. You may have to make sacrifices of other things that are really important in order to make this happen. But I'm telling you, if you don't schedule it, it will never happen. Jesus saw that he could get sleep you know, whenever he could, like in the boat with his disciples. But he was willing to even sacrifice sleep to have time alone with the Father in prayer. Listen, if spending time alone with God in prayer is a priority for you, there will be sacrifices that have to be made. Our schedules are full. They're full. Second, because distractions were prevalent, Jesus got alone. So he made a schedule, he made sacrifices, but he also... He also set time to be alone. It says he went out to a desolate place. He got away from the distractions by going to a quiet spot where he could meet with the Father without interruption. So notice the progression here. It says he went out. Out from where? He left the house where he and the disciples were staying. This is probably Peter and Andrew's house in Capernaum. This is the house where the entire city had, had gathered just a few hours earlier. But he also, secondly, went to a desolate place. He didn't just leave the house, he left that area because he needed to get away from where others would be going about their morning activities. He didn't want anything to get in the way. The word desolate here means literally lonely. It means to be uninhabited by people. So he didn't go to the front yard. He didn't go to the corner of the street. He crossed over a few streets and went out away from where people were. You know, I find that one of the reasons why we sort of get tripped up in our prayer time with God is because we try to do it in the same place where other things are happening, where we carry out other responsibilities. And so there's always the distraction at our computer, right? And trying to pray and then, oh, I need to send that email to Harvey. Um, or maybe there's that, uh, that phone call that we need to answer. Or there's that memo that we need to respond to. Or there's that meeting that we need to prepare for, right? There's always that stuff because we're sitting in that workspace and that's where it happens. So find a place that's removed from your normal day. Uh, if you're a mom with children, um, this is going to be a challenge. But it's not impossible. Take 15 minutes during their naps. Or give the kids an, an activity to do, like coloring or looking at books. 
and lock yourself in the bathroom. You may have to do that. By the way, training them to, to learn to sit still and be quiet and have a quiet time will prepare them to, as they get older, have a quiet time with God. Third, notice, because the Father was present, Jesus prayed. It says at the end of verse 35, and there he, what? He prayed. Everything led up to this. The schedule, the sacrifice, the solitude, it all enabled Jesus to meet with the Father. I've had people say to me, you know what, I pray all the time. I pray without ceasing. So I don't need a time set aside to pray. And my response is, hey, I agree with you. Prayer does not demand that we stop everything to talk to God. But the fact is, if it was important enough for the Son of God to meet alone with the Father in prayer, uh, then it should be even more of a priority for us. Prayer is hard work. And sometimes we experience distraction, not from the things that are outside of us, but from the things that are inside of us. It might be a mind that wanders. It might be that you fall asleep. Have you ever woken up after praying <laughs> in a pool of your own drool? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you experience this, try implementing some of these uh, practical things. These are things that I do. Um, a little maybe unorthodox, but they, they work for me. First, pray aloud. Um, or if you're deaf, sign. See, when I'm just sort of praying in my head silently, that's when I'm praying like this. Lord, it's so good to be able to come to you. And as I think about what I'm having for lunch right now, I'm, what am I going to do at the Chiefs game? I'm going to, are they going to, man, is Travis Kelsey going to, you know, your mind just starts going off. But when I, out loud, it's got to go from my mind out into words. Or signs. So, pray aloud. Second, pray with your eyes open. It's easy to become, for me when my eyes are closed, to become just, oh, I'm really getting relaxed and sort of in this meditative mood right now. And, but when my eyes are open, I'm just, and I'm not looking at anything really, my eyes are just open and I'm just talking to God out loud like I'd be talking to you if you were in my uh, office. Three, pray, try standing up or pray walking around so that you don't get so comfortable in that chair with your nice warm hop, cof, uh, cup of coffee. No, walk around and talk to God with your eyes open. Those things help me. And then it also helps me to pray through a written prayer list. So I've got it written down. I've got requests that I'm adding to. I get all the time people saying, hey, Mike, will you pray for this? Things come out through the church email. I'm going to write those things down. They're going to be part of my prayer list. And I'm going to pray through that. I may not get through the whole prayer list every time, but I'm going to work my way through. There are some things I pray for on Mondays, some things on Tuesdays, some things on Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Have a written prayer list. So I hope some of those things help you. Um, we don't have time to go through the last one, but it's the Acts of Prayer, A-C-T-S. I'll just give you the blanks for those of you who are kind of blank nerds and won't be able to rest the rest of the day. Here's what the blanks are. A stands for adoration. Uh, all this is simply adoring, praising God for who he is. It's an acronym that helps you. A, adoration. C stands for confession. This kind of keeps short accounts with God. You just confess your sin. Um, Keeps things fresh. Uh, C, confession. T in Acts stands for thanksgiving. This is where you can just um, express your gratitude to God for his grace, his faithfulness. Um, it's great to be able to, to just enter into his courts with thanksgiving. His uh, gates with thanksgiving, courts with praise. The S stands for supplication. Remember supplication? The specific requests. There you have it. The Acts of Prayer. That's an acronym so that if... You know, I, I can kind of have a, a pattern or flow or something to, to follow in prayer. I hope that helps you. Um, you know, God wants you to meet with him. He doesn't need you to meet with him. You need to meet with him. And he knows that. So meet with him. If you don't know him, you can meet with him today. Surrender to him. You heard the gospel, the good news of why Jesus died during communion. Trust him. Surrender your life to him. Follow him. 
you'll be eternally grateful. Father, thank you for the time we've had in worship. I know so basic, so simple, um, but so essential. I know there's people here that are just great prayer warriors, and I appreciate so much how you use their ministry to advance what you're doing. But a lot of us struggle with prayer, and we need help. We need grace. So would you be glorified by guiding our hearts and turning our hearts toward you so that we call on you and you will answer and do great and mighty things that we do not know. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Stand as we conclude our service. I want to close with um, what God said to Israel through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Have a great week in the Lord. Mm -hmm.